الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن واله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر وأنت على كل شيء قدير اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مرحوما واجعل التفرق بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تدع فينا شقيا ولا محرومة اللهم آمين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أعوذ بالله السميع العليم الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى The most compassionate, the most merciful All praise and thanks are due to him And peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم He who is guided by the will of Allah No one can misguide him And he who is misguided No one can guide him except Allah سبحانه وتعالى I do bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, uh, it's our first session talking about the start of the hijrah, the beginning of the migration to al Madina by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As I need sometimes to keep reminding you, one of the main and most important things that we need or our aims from listening to reading, having an idea about the seerah, is to connect ourselves with the, you know, basic foundations of the founders of those people. We need it. Psychologically, we need it. From, you know, we need to raise our children. We need to feel, to have the gratitude towards those, because of them, we are enjoying Islam. So, and the seerah, as I told you, it's, it's bo bigger than sunnah. Sunnah is the direct legislations about haram and halal. Yes, no, do, don't, okay? Which is direct. They, we call it tashri'at, which is the teachings or the rulings or the legislations. However, the seerah, it has something, you know, it broadens your mind to understand the full picture. And one of the great beautiful benefits of having an idea about this seerah is your ability to make the analogy, qiyas, with what has happened or used to happen and what could be happening to you will be much more bigger and higher. Your, your ability, okay, so Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to do this sometimes, okay, is it something new? No, the analogy will be much bigger. Anyway, today, We'll start talking about Al-Hijrah, the migration. After talking, uh, now we covered around 12 years and half from the beginning of the history of Islam. We had, inshallah, a good idea about this. Now, while approaching, talking about the Hijrah, we have an idea about those who migrated at the very beginning. We'll try to fix some misconceptions or some famous well-known things that might not be true one of them for example the story of Hijr of Umar radiallahu anhu which is very famous it's not a sound hadith that's not authentic <laughs> they're very well known we will come to it to know those who did it at the very beginning what happened to some of them and we will be focusing on a very authentic story of Umm Salama radiallahu anha who later became what Umm Salama, do you know Umm Salama? She was from those who was in, in, in Abyssinia, Habasha, do you remember? <laughs> and Umm Salama has, uh, you know, an amazing, amazing story of the Hijrah, about how she suffered because of the differences between the family and the tribe of herself and the tribe of her husband, and what happened with their kid. So sometimes, you know, the beauty of the seerah, you delve into as if you are in a movie film. <laughs> it's not just an information of do and don't. You will know that, uh, you know, a Muslim woman, when she's suffering because of the hijab, for example, or she's suffering because she's not allowed to be with hair, for example, friends in the uh, beaches at the summer, you know, because of the bikini, it's haram to be there and this kind. When sometimes I feel, oh, I'm very upset, all everything, all this difficult life. When you know some of the, <laughs> you know, the first Sahaba, what they suffered because of La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. Sometimes you see you are facing nothing, literally nothing. This is, by the way, we need it. 
we do need it anyway but now let me just uh, share with you the following important things about hijrah now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while I was preparing I remember that the vast majority of us we are muhajirin true or false yes <laughs> we are immigrants we will talk about immigration we the majority we are immigrants mm, so it's good some of us and I know some of us they came with their willpower and some of us they came they were forced to come we are not of the same background however we share the concept of immigration let's have an idea because if I raised our feelings to know the similarities between us and the Sahaba, your way of understanding the Hijrah will be completely different. <laughs> completely different. Because you say, what? So I'm doing something so Yes, you are. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the concept of migration for the sake of Allah. Now, I will recite the ayah in Arabic. I will read the direct meaning or in English, then I'll try to make some of the analogy that could be applicable on some of us. Okay? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَن يُهَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجِدْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَاغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعًا وَمَن يَخْرُجْ مِن بَيْتِهِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ يُدْرِكْهُ الْمَوْتُ فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا It's one of the most beautiful glad tidings, good news for immigrants, this ayah. <laughs> I repeat, وَمَنْ يُهَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجِدْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعَى Whoever immigrates in the cause of Allah I will explain what do mean by in the cause of Allah. <laughs> but literally, whoever immigrates in the cause of Allah will find many safe havens and bountiful resources throughout the earth. Look, this is a promise from Allah. The one who immigrates in the cause of Allah. You see? The word in the cause of Allah is a very wide area of khair and goodness. In the cause of Allah. Safe havens and bountiful resources. A lot of khair, a lot of goodness. And new openings, new gates, and new rizq, and new whatever. In case, because this is a conditional what? It's a conditional concept. If you are immigrating in the cause of Allah, you will find. But if I'm not immigrating in the cause of Allah, not necessarily, and another law, or something else. Okay? So sometimes the gates of khair and goodness, when they are open, it gives you an idea about your intention. Anyway, let's continue. قال ومن يخرج من بيته مهاجرا إلى الله ورسوله ثم يدركه الموت فقد وقع أجره على الله. Those who leave their homes and die while immigrating to Allah and His Messenger, their reward, their reward has already been secured with Allah سبحانه وتعالى. وكان الله غفور رحيم and Allah is the All Forgiving, Most Merciful. As I told you, it contains a beautifully glad tidings, immigration. Now, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started the immigration by the commandment of Allah. For hijrah for Prophet Muhammad, it was taklif. It's not an option. What do you mean by taklif? Commandment from Allah, do it. So it's by an obligation now. They have to do it. At that time, at that specific historical, physical, literal time, the first Muslims, they were asked that they must immigrate for the sake of Allah because they were completely, completely prohibited from practicing their religion. So let's understand the following beautiful meaning. Now, number one, if you immigrate, now immigration in its simple meaning, leaving your 
mother country, your homeland, the place you were born, the place where you feel most secure for whatever reason, you leave what is classified initially as more comfortable, more support. For some reasons, you leave it in the cause of Allah. Now, in the cause of Allah, out of the mercy of Allah, it's uh, like a big, wide range of possibilities. Okay? Now, once you are immigrating to protect your religion or to live in a more peaceful environment to apply your religion or to be closer to Allah compared with the place that you have left, you are muhajir fi sabilillah. <laughs> and I think we have a good percentage of those people who were kicked, especially if we want to, take, to speak in a political terminology. I'm not generalizing. I'm not saying everyone in Canada is muhajir fi sabilillah. Don't misquote me, okay? Because some people, they are not. But at least when I know about thousands of Syrians, thousands of Egyptians, thousands of Palestinians, to the best of my knowledge, they have no other place, no other option. <laughs> and the main reason why they left their countries, simply they are tortured, and they will be killed, and they will be imprisoned, ayyakul rabbi Allah, true or false? Politically, is that the, the, the condition or not? Don't we have now, now, maybe the most, the clearest, undisputable example now is Syria. More than two millions directly by the regime were killed. An average 10 to 12 millions, they were kicked out after torturing hundreds of thousands from their country. So, no country, no homeland. <laughs> so, okay. Why they are tortured and killed? Sectarian regime who hates Muslims and torturing them and killing them. Completely, it's a religious war. <laughs> and this is like a practical example. Now, so the motivation, you've been kicked out of your country because of this. Now, this does not mean necessarily you accepted this fate and you are coming to this country for the sake of Allah. So your intention is very important. So am I coming to this for the sake of taking care to make, to protect myself and my family to be close to the religion? Yes or no? If yes, you are part of what this ayah covers. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُهَجَرْ فِي سَبِيلَ اللَّهِ Have I left my country? Even by leaving my country could be by force. I was kicked out of my country or I decided to leave my country. Regardless, I'm out of my country. But why? Because I'm not able to apply my religion. I can't live as a Muslim. I will be tortured if I'm practicing my Islam. If I'm expressing my basic rights as a normal Muslim, I might be tortured or jailed or killed or tortured or disappeared. If that's the case, inshallah, you are muhajir fi sabilillah. And what is closer from this area and somehow, not necessarily you are tortured. We have many other Arabs now. They can't live in many Arab countries. What's the main reason? If they just express their attitude towards Islam, they might be jailed or kicked out or disappeared or tortured. True or false? So inshallah, those they are entitled to be considered under this ayah, but with the condition type. Let's now complete the full picture from the other side of the coin. Type. I'm supposed, in theory, I left my country because I'm not able to protect my religion. Which means to practice the basics of my religion. To go to the masjid, to pray, <laughs> to grow my beard, to wear the hijab, to eat halal food, to, take, to educate my children at least to the, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied. That's basic. I'm not talking about a state or politics. Or basic things as, a, as an individual or as a family. I'm supposed to teach my children what I believe in. This is the basic rights. Now, okay, suppose that I left because I'm not able in my homeland country or motherland <coughs> to do this. <coughs> I'm allowed to be in another country as long as I'm able to do these things. So that's why many people, they keep asking, 
are we allowed to live in a non-Muslim country? Because this is a very common question all the time. Yeah. You, you hear it, I think. You hear the debate all the time. Yes, with two basic conditions. To the best of my knowledge, there is a consensus on it. Two basic conditions. You can practice your religion, and the thing that some people, they don't know about it, you are able to manifest, not just to practice. Not to practice in secret. <laughs> I repeat. <laughs> practice is one pillar. What is, the, what is the other condition? To show it. To live it. To manifest. To show it. Which means, I will not be excused. I will not be, let's say, uh, taken to the jail or tortured if I show my religion, basics. With two these basic conditions, I'm allowed to be in wherever. Plus, I will be a muhajir if my intention of leaving my beloved homeland with this intention. Okay? This should be clear, inshallah, in our mind. Because sometimes, if the conditions changed, the hukum will change. May Allah protect all of us. <laughs> Wallahi. Many people, they don't know what they might be facing. Anyway, now this is number one. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we need to know about that sometimes for the case of protecting your religion, your aqidah, your heart, your something, as long as you have, alhamdulillah, freedom to live as a Muslim and to have this kind of Muslim gatherings, to have Muslim masajid, Muslim madaris, Muslim kada, alhamdulillah, you should make benefit because part of our faith that earth belongs to who? Who is the owner of earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you need to know that anna al-arda lillah yurithuha may yasha. You need to know when you move from a land to a land, I'm not discussing for in, in a political terminology. <laughs> I'm discussing on a faith-based terminology. You need to feel that you belong to Allah. Okay? Wherever Allah makes it easy for you to live your religion, to show your religion, be happy that it's part of the rizq of the real owner of the land. It should be Part of, uh, part of the facilitating of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah wants you, me, they, we, him, she, whatever to spread the khair and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we need to, to put these concepts together now another thing as long as we are talking about leaving and immigrating immigrating we are talking about physical move from a country to a country, from a place to a place. In this context, we need to realize as Muslims, because the majority of us, we are immigrants, and the majority of us, we were raised under sykes Picos, you know, sykes Pico, uh, let's say, what would you call it, notion, faith. <laughs> now, the majority of us, we came from Arab countries. We were born, most of us, or all of us, we were born that we know Syria. Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Emirates. Just 70 years ago, none of these borders did exist. Do you know this or not? We just have a Muslim big piece of land. If you were living in Morocco, on Casablanca, or in Tunisia, or if you were living in Jakarta, or in you living in what we know now as UAE, you just start your engine or ride your camel. By the way, they still, many, ma many Westerners, they still, that most of us in our country still we are riding camels. <laughs> you know, sometimes when washing. <laughs> have you parked your camel there? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> Well, I have a very fast speed camel. <laughs> Five speeds. <laughs> anyway, so you just ride your camel or start your engine. Just go wherever you want. No borders. No visa. I don't know if you know 
that the concept of visa and the passport started just after the Second World War. Why I'm mentioning this? Because now from one angle, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Wallahi inna ki la ahabbu ard allahi ilay walaw la anna qawmaki akhrajuni minki ma kharajtu. By the way, I'm doing now fixing possible misconceptions. Now, Prophet Muhammad said about immigration and the fact that he was forced to leave his homeland, his mother country, which he loves, which is by default most of us, this is by nature. We love the place that we were born in and we call it Watan, mother country, my homeland, my country, whatever terminology you use, good. But be careful, as a Muslim, we don't have this kind of complete loyalty just because you were born in a place. Our biggest loyalty, where is the place that you can live peacefully with your religion? Not necessarily where the place just you were born in. Why I'm saying this? Because unfortunately, when the British and the French, around more than 100 years ago, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and they decided to divide our countries. Now, for example, Syrians and Jordanians, Palestinians and Lebanese, all together, all of them, they were called was Levant, Bilad Sham. When you come to what we know now as the south of Syria or the north of Jordan, okay, some tribes in the area of Dar'a and Ramtha, they just opened their eyes, part of them they became Syrians, part of them they became what? Jordanians. <laughs> With a new border division from a political things. Out of a sudden, the Syrian part of the same tribe is asked to be loyal for his country and to consider anyone from his family who belongs to the Jordanian country, a possible enemy if he wants to cross the border. You get my point? Because this is my watan. Naam? He's not allowed to come to my watan. And the same thing applies on Jordanians. The same thing applies on Syrians and Lebanese. The same thing, the same thing, you know, Iraqi and Kuwait, the same. It was just an open areas. So you need to understand the concept of motherland homeland which means for the fact just a french and the british soldiers they decided to divide your country islam does not allow you just out of a sudden and for the fake loyalty just to kill your brother if he comes to your border because you became with a nationality and he is holding another nationality this is haram and unfortunately most of us we were raised to believe in these things, and we have these passports and these nationalities, and you, because you know, this is my weapon. We need it for, you know, you have to fight for Turabul Watan. This is a, sometimes, from one angle, that's true. Man duna malihi, shaheed, man duna irdi, shaheed. But it's misused politically, especially against Arabs. <laughs> you need to understand that your loyalty is not just because some politicians, they decided to divide your country, your own family who became with another nationality, you will be the, your enemy and they have to come with the permission to come to your country. Even if politically this is the norm, as a Muslim you have no right to have this kind of hatred and feeling, I considered someone else. No! The ties between you and him is much more bigger than the po political bo borders. Especially that this political border has been decided by the colonial power. <laughs> So when we understand the idea of migration and the homeland and the motherland and the concept of loyalty for that, and Prophet Muhammad said it, understand it in light of, you know, understanding that we are as well brainwashed in with the concept of the mother country and the homeland. <laughs> yes, by nature you love it, but be careful when you became loyal to a political border by the colonial power. <laughs> Don't mix these two <laughs> things together, okay? This is part of your understanding to the concept of immigration or leaving the Watan. Okay, now, 
اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد. Let's start today al hijra ila Medina al Mawlid. It was like an introduction. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said in a hadith that رأيت في المنام أني أهاجر من مكة إلى أرض بها نخل فذهب وهلي إلى أنها اليمامة أو هجر فإذا هذا هي المدينة يثرب إن هذا الرئيشين قال إني أريد دار هجرتكم ذات نخل بين لابتين Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in an authentic hadith he says that the first you know they were fighting, struggling against the non-believers, they were torturing them. Then he saw in his dream, in his vision, that in his, and by the way, Prophet Muhammad said, the vision that they see while they are sleeping, it's part of the revelation for them. That's why, just pause, part of this. Ibrahim السلام, what happened to him? He saw in his the dream that he is, he is slaughtering. Okay? He immediately went to his son. Oh, my dear son, I saw such and such. Then he replied immediately his son, Ismail alayhi salam, Ya abati fa'al ma tu'umar. By the way, this is a very specific context for prophets because it's revelation. <laughs> it's not something, be, be, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> no one is allowed to say I saw in my dream that I did such and such <laughs> you go and apply it be careful <laughs> this is very special special case just for prophets and messengers and it's part of the way that Allah decided to communicate with them for us the majority of what we see it will be dreams from the shaitan okay be careful okay <laughs> don't use your dreams to say Allah I received the revelation that I'm hitting my wife so I, I'm just following the commandment of Allah, Sheikh. Allah Habibi. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. So be careful, okay? So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so قال أري رأيت في المنام أني أهاجر. I saw myself in my dream that uh, I'm uh, migrating from Mecca to the place that has a lot of palm trees. At the end, he said, قال, هِيَ الْمَدِينَةُ يَثْرِبْ He said, in my dream, I thought it's such and such place. Then I was told in the dream, and I realized in the dream that it is Yathrib. Because Yathrib is one of the names of Al-Madina Al-Munawwara. Then, in another way, قال, أُرِيدُ دَارَ هِجْرَتِكُمْ I was shown the home of our immigration, the destination of our immigration. It is a place that full of palm trees قال بين لابتين who knows what is the لابتين from the Arabs huh what else لابتين yeah yeah زكالله خير yes to the best of my knowledge it's the huge piece of land that contains the rocks came from volcanic sources. Huge. By the way, Al-Laba, Al-Ard, that Al-Sukhur, Al-Sa'ba, Jiddan, Jiddan, Al-Sawda, Mithra Sukhur Al-Burkaniya. And by the way, the Medina, naturally, by Allah, it's protected from armies from two sides, like volcanic stones that they, which by millions, and they are fixed in a way, the hooves of the horses, they can't walk. Which means like a natural what? Protection. <laughs> Completely. That's why just another pose. You know Ghazwat al-Ahzab? Now the Medina is naturally protected completely from two sides. Then it has two other sides. One of them, it was completely closed by Bani Qurayza. They have their own, you know, forts there. So it's protected from three places. Labatain and Banu Quraidah. The only place that they might be approached is this side. In this side they did the trench. Al-Khandaq. And we have. That's why, you know, the political reaction of Banu Quraidah was horrible at that time. It was, it was a war. So everything was closed and they were protected as a nation. 
at home as a country and when they receive and you know the rest we will come to, to it inshallah so anyway so prophet muhammad was shown that it's a piece of land full of palm trees it's protected by this kind of specific natural let's say uh, protection then he was told that it is yathrib this is how it happened with prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam now from the first people who immigrated abu salama radiyallahu anhu he is classified as awwal muhajir min makkah ila al madina <laughs> by the way abu salama and um salama they have an amazing bit of status in islam and subhanallah abu salama passed away and his wife became the wife of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi later on Oh, the first one who immigrated after Prophet Muhammad received the commandment from Allah that now start the hijrah. Khalas. Now leave Mecca. Go to establish your religion so that you can protect yourself and live in peace. قال كان أبو سلمة أول من هاجر رضي الله أو من هاجر مكة إلى المدينة قبل بيعة العقبة بالسنة. وتقول أم سلمة إن أبا سلمة أول بيت هاجر إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مصعب بن عمير وابن أم مكتوم رضي الله عنه من أوائل المهاجرين وكانا يقرئان القرآن From the very beginning of the immigrants مصعب بن عمير رضي الله عنه and ابن أم مكتوم رضي الله عنهما من أوائل المهاجرين Do you remember مصعب? Who's مصعب? Musa bin Umair, one of his titles is what? The first ambassador of Islam. You know, according to the narration of the seerah, he was between 24 and 26, which means still a young man. So he was the first ambassador from the first who immigrated, radiallahu anhu. And Musa'ab, radiallahu anhu, he used to be from the wealthiest people of Mecca. He left everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ibn Ummi Maktoum, Abdullah Ibn Ummi Maktoum, from the non Arabs. Please, Arabs don't answer. Who knows who is Abdullah? By the way, memorizing the names of the Sahaba and their special status is very important. It makes you really enjoy reading and having the seerah. Who knows who's Abdullah Ibn Ummi Maktoum? There's something specific about this person in the Quran. Yes. Huh? Was he His name? No, I said wasn't he blind? The blind, yes, that's true. Yes. Okay. Next step. What's something special about him? He was a blind, that's true. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he was a blind Sahabi. Tab next step. There's something very special about him. What is it? None Arabs. Masha Allah. Hat, goal. Yes, score. <laughs> Ten points. Do you, do you know, do you know, do you know the, the uh, chapter, Surah of Abasa? Abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahul a'ma wa ma yudrika la'allahu yazzakka. This is specific chapter, the beginning of it, it was revealed about Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. At the time of Mecca, he was from the first of the Sahaba, and he was blind, he can't see. At a certain point, he came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to ask him about something. And it happened that Muhammad Sallallahu he did his own ijtihad. Which means, you know, he was, he was in a status about to possible, let's say, or a possibility to make like a good da'wah opportunity with some of the kuffar of Mecca. So his mind was engaged in focusing to communicate with the non-believers. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum came to ask Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam something. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and Prophet Muhammad, you know, in, in our social way of thinking, we say, okay, he's my friend, he's my close friend, so I can speak with him later. So he ignored him and he focused on trying to bring some of the big leaders of the kuffar of Mecca to Islam. So he did not give him the needed, uh, let's say, uh, attention. In his mind, he was doing it for the sake of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to him a special chapter that you should have given the priority for Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. So look to his status. The case of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew. Allah knows the ghaib. You know the future. 
that this specific group of non-believers, they will not and they don't care, so don't waste your time with them. So he has a special status, a special surah, raising his status, honoring him, and asking Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that he should have done something else for the sake of honoring Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he was from the first immigrants leaving Mecca to uh, uh, al Madina. radiyallahu anhu. قال وقد تتابع المهاجرون. Then, from the very beginning, Abu Salama, Mus'ab bin Umayr, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, then later on, from the well-known Sahaba, Bilal ibn Rabah, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, Ammar bin Yasir, Awa Umar ibn al-Khattab, fi 20 min ashabih. This is from the first beginning, Ammar, Bilal, and Umar bin al-Khattab. Now, <clears throat> from the stories that I think I need to fix, uh, or to, uh, that we need to fix our uh, information, that according to Dr. Akram Diya al-Umari, Dr. Akram Diya al-Umari, he is one of the most... Uh, well-known specialists in studying and editing and investigating the narrations of the seerah. So I will be quoting what he said in his book in seerah. قال وأما قصة هجرة عمر عمر وأنها كانت علنية وفيها التحدي لقريش فلم تصح. Now the very famous chapter that many of us we fall in the trap because it was very famous and we did narrate it sometimes sometimes some certain stories from the seerah it might be famous everyone knows it but it's not authentic <laughs> sometimes it's not necessarily a lie or fabricated but very weak narration so it's high preferable not to use it because we have our own standard we are seeking the most and highest authentic so that when we use it, because sometimes we need to build understanding legislation on it. We say, look, as long as Umar radiallahu did such and such, why not to do such and But wait, if this is not authentic or very weak, how come you use it as a base to build legislation on it? This is important in, in, in this case. So it's not, it's not an authentic story. The story which is not authentic, that Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, came and he was challenging all Meccans in public and he said I am about to start my immigration if there is a man of you who dares to face me let him come now and no one dare to do it so this is not an authentic one then he continues وهناك رواية تثبت تفصيلا مختلفا في هجرته وتؤكد كونها كانت سرا كباقي الصحابة. Now the authentic narrations about his hijra, uh, the narrations, all of them, they confirm that he did it like others. They did it in secret. So the migration at the very beginning it happened secret because simply for political reasons and for security reasons the people of مكة they realized the power of Muslims and they don't want them to leave. It's either we control them or we simply get rid of them or kill them. And we know that later on, maybe next time or the week after, that when they felt that some Muslims, they did leave Mecca and they are trying to establish their gathering in another place, they decided and they already took the decision, the decision to get rid of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they wanted to kill him. The main reason why they were hesitant in killing him basically it's a big matter of a tribal consideration. Because Prophet Muhammad was from the most honored tribe you know in in the Arabic Peninsula. And in the tribe itself we have clans. Okay? For example Banu Hashim, Banu such and such, Banu Vyaf, all from Quraysh. Quraysh is the most honorable tribe. In Quraysh, Banu Hashim from the highest and most honorable group of this tribe. And they are numbers plus their prestige. So in the Arabic mentality and the tribal mentality, if you killed someone, they have allies. Even if they are non-believers, they will fight you and kill you. So they will be started killing each other. 
And by the way, by the will of Allah, it was one of the main reasons of protecting the da'wah at the very beginning. One of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making Muhammad from Bani Hashim, from Quraysh, that for many considerations, even the, the, the very tough mushrikeen like Abu Jahl, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, okay, Al-Walid ibn Mughira, they hate him badly. They would love to kill him at any moment, but they did not dare to do it because he's protected. Protected in the human sense from tribal power. So, subhanAllah, it's by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they decided to take a khalas, they started immigration, they took a decision that they gathered a representative from each tribe and they were planning to attack him and to kill him with one hit of, let's say, 20, 30 swords, so that the Banu Hashim, when they say, okay, we will take revenge against who? If those who killed him, they were a group representing all Arabs in the Arabic Peninsula. So no one can say, okay, I will take it from general. Therefore, they have to uh, just, just to stop asking to take revenge. Anyway, this we will discuss later. But I'm just giving you an idea why they were immigrating now in secret because simply the mightest power in Arabic Peninsula it was against them completely using all of their powers so Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu he did his immigration in this way which means secretly now let's go back to Abu Salama and Um Salama I will start now in the coming let's say 10 minutes giving you at the very beginning uh, because the book that I'm, I'm, I'm quoting now, uh, he focused on the suffering and the pain of some of the first immigrants. And he decided to bring the story of Um Salama in specific. This might help us to see to what level really we might have challenges and we might be suffering for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes when you see others, what happened to them, you, your problem will be... <laughs> viewed as something really okay much more or less you yes brother before you start can i ask you about the immigration because uh, when i was in pakistan uh, even though all the even afghanistan in india most of the scholars we believe uh, the here is uh, immigration in front of actually not in pakistan in all arab world yeah. even one of the other uh, great scholars in pakistan uh, in room uh, dr israel He's saying, uh, just forget what uh, he declared for Shahadat and all. What is the intention of the immigration? Like uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, uh, he come to uh, ask about the immigration. And the, because he was established as one of the powerful, uh, one of the powerful person of the Makkah. And then he uh, uh, left everything and he go to the Medina. That's his intention. Because uh, there is so many fight over there. He declared or not declared, you know? So now, to the best of my readings, yeah. He did not declare it. If you take it from hadith investigation narrations, he did not declare it. But, but as I told you, one of our challenges in the Muslim Ummah that we have a lot of widely spread stories without authentic base. Many things, oh, by the way. Especially opposed just there. Now, if I want just to give you an idea about how many stories about prophets that is spread in the mentality of the Muslims, which is not true at all, you will be amazed. About prophets in the Quran, Qasas al-Quran, the stories of the Quran. When you come to the story of Ayyub alayhi salam, or the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam, or the story of Dawood alayhi salam, if you make a survey to ask the people what they know about these stories, you will discover that high percentage of knowledge that they have, it's from the Israeliyat. Which means, which, which means the narrations that they were told by Jews and Christians and they are not authentic at all, but widely spread. And anyone in any masjid, out of his memory, if he want to give a story about a prophet, he will be quoting them. But very famous, but not authentic. <laughs> which is, okay, this is, this is a human phenomena. But in Islam, if we want to discuss scholarship, alhamdulillah, we have a group of ulama and we have authentic resources to tell you what is right and what is wrong. The idea is, are we matching the need of numbers of Muslim ummah by the 
let's say, needed number of scholars to fix the conception, the misconception, this is the, the challenge. The, the scholars who study, they know. And those who are uh, interested in seeking the Islamic scholarship and knowledge, they know. <laughs> but not necessarily the majority of the people. So from authentic, authenticity-wise, his immigration was not public. Okay? Inshallah. So let's start at least the very beginning of the story of Um Salama, and I will stop, inshallah, in the law. And by the way, in case if you have a, a new visitors, a new guests, tomorrow we have our weekly tafsir session as well. So if you are interested, you can come tomorrow between Maghrib and Isha, inshallah. Now, قال من صور معاناة المهاجرين ما لقاه أبو سلم وزوجته وابنهما يوم هجرتهما. تقول أم سلم. Now the narration basically is by أم سلم. Now اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد. It's an authentic narration, a صحيح one. أم سلم says لما أجمع أبو سلم الخروج إلى المدينة رحل لي بعيره ثم حملني عليه. She says, when Abu Salama decided to migrate, and I am as his wife, and they used to have a young son. So he prepared the camel. The camel, when it's prepared specially for traveling long distances, they call it rahila. Because not every camel is able to be a rahila. Anyway, he said, Hamalani alayh, so Abu Salama prepared the rahila, which is the camel, which is prepared specially for long distance traveling. And he said, he asked me to ride the camel with my son. قال, ومعي ابني سلمة, and I'm holding my Salama in my lap. قال, ثم خرج بي يقود بي بعير, and he started leaving Mecca. فلما رأته رجال بن المغيرة, بن عبد الله, بن عم, بن عمر, بن مخزوم, when my family, she is from بني مخزوم. Her people now, the tribal mentality now. Okay, she is his wife but she is their daughter <laughs> so and they are still kuffar non-believers when they saw Abu Salama taking his wife and she is from Bani Makhzum and leaving Mecca they came إليه فقالوا هذه نفسك غلبتنا عليها أرأيت صاحبتك هذه على ما نتركك تسير بها في البلاد he said look in short, you decided to change your faith and your life. We are not able to control you. On what base you want to control our daughter? <laughs> She's our daughter. يعني, like نحكي بالعربي, حبيبي, روين رايح. You know حبيبي وين رايح? It's exactly, يعني, okay, <laughs> but with yourself do whatever. She's our daughter. This is the tribal mentality. So, قال, قالت فنزعوا خطام البعير من يده فأخذوه منه. so they attacked him and they pulled the rope that controls you know the, the you know the, the nose of the camel which means the the steering of the camel. <laughs> okay, they took it by by force and they pulled me with the camel and I as Om Salama was on the camel with my son. she continues قال وغضب عند ذلك بنو عبد الأسد Tribalism now started. Abu Salama from Banu Abdul Asad, another tribe. Abu Salama from Bani Makhzum. So Banu Makhzum came and attacked a man from Banu Abdul Asad. <laughs> and they took his wife, which is their daughter. Who became angry now? Banu Abdul Asad, the tribe of Abu Salama. Then قالت غضب بنو عبد الأسد رهط أبي سلم فقالوا لا والله لا نترك ابننا عندها إذ نزعتموها من صاحبنا. They said, Hey look, she is your daughter, but her son is our son. Mentality. بمعنى okay, take your daughter, but the son is ours. So the, it's, it's like a dispute on the property. <laughs> okay? So this is our son. He, he's holding our, our name. قالت فتجاذبوا ابني سلم بينهم حتى خلعوا يده. Now, 
the both tribes, men from Banu Makhzum and men from uh, Banu Abd al-Assad, they said, okay, now Banu Makhzum, they are not to do, able to do anything with Abu Salama. Banu Abd al-Assad, they can't do anything with Um Salama. They, both of them, they physically start holding the kid, Salama. She's very a very small kid. Pull from here, pull from here, you know, خَلَعُ يَدَهُ which means, you know, the, uh, his arm was, you know, uh, Yes? Dislocated. Dislocated. His arm was completely dislocated from its place. <laughs> you see? The power is a small kid. Dislocated. فقالت فخلعوا حتى خلعوا يده وانطلق بنو به بنو عبد الأسد وحبسني بنو المغيرة عندهم انطلق زوجي أبو سلمة إلى المدينة. Look what happened now. You know the arm was dislocated. بنو عبد الأسد they took the son by force. بنو مخزوم took أم سلمة by force. And Abu Salama left both of them and went to the Medina. This is how her suffering, the story of her suffering started. Um Salama radiallahu anha. قالت ففرق بيني وبين زوجي وبين ابني. So I was forced and disconnected from my son and my, <coughs> my husband. She continues. قال فكنت أخرج كل غدات فأجلس بالأبطح فما زلت أبكي حتى she said, I stayed on this status every day from the early morning. I leave my place. I sat on a certain hill. I keep crying all the day. I'm not, I'm not allowed to see my son and I'm not allowed to follow my husband. And my husband cannot come because there might anything could happen to him. You know, and I stayed a full year every day. I just leave the gathering of my tribe. I just keep trying and return back for a full year. Now, the most important thing that I need from this to, to compare our suffering with theirs. And by the way, their suffering led, led to the fact that you and me are Muslims now. By the way, if the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did not face these challenges, you and me could be anything but Muslims. <laughs> anything. I don't know what we could have been, but anything. Imagine. Just go wild with your imagination. Now. She continues. قال حتى مر بي رجل من بني عمي أحد بني المغيرة فرأى ما بي فرحمني فقال لبني المغيرة ألا تخرجون المسكينة فرق فرقتم بينها وبين زوجها وبين ولادها فقالت فقالوا لي الحقي بزوجك إن شئت. Now there is amazing. I will stop here now. إن شاء الله. So سبحان الله تعالى الحمد لله. Now yes, we believe that. We are created by Allah and our inner nature contains the basic of khair. At a certain point, one of her cousins, you know, emotionally, he became, you know, having this kind of sympathy and empathy for her. So he pushed, you know, the tribe. I say, it's like saying, yani, shame on you. <laughs> what are you achieving from just leaving her crying all the time? Just leave her. You know, her word, his word came in a suitable time. Then they gathered, they took her like a decision and say, okay, go and follow your, <laughs> your husband. Now, we have another very interesting, very interesting status when she started to immigrate by herself 450 kilometers in the desert. And by the way, now, 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 if a woman wants to travel for 500 you know, in, in, in the deserts, even with paved, good, nice uh, streets, highways, with a good car, she might count to 10 and 100 because if she's at night and any problem happened with the car, Allah knows what, what could happen. It's very dangerous. What do you think about that time? So another very interesting incident happened with another non-believer. It gives an idea about the khair still inside the heart of Many people. Next time we will start Zakum Lahiran. 
see you tomorrow in the tafsir in case if you are interested. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.